It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Well, folks, welcome in. Got a bunch of great herd mentality questions to dive into. Let's get started. First one comes from Alex. Alex says, I went down a weird thought trail, and I'm keen to hear your thoughts on the podcast. Obviously, Josh Allen is a generational talent, and it is our quarterback for the foreseeable future. However, I'm intrigued to explore how many drafts we have before we need to consider a long-term succession plan. Josh has been immense over the last few years, but he does put his body on the line, particularly in the big moments. I wonder how long it could be until his style of play catches up to him, given you've pointed out he doesn't subscribe to off-season conditioning like some other quarterbacks do. Also, in case it wasn't obvious, I'm not in any way advocating for replacing 17, but wondering how many years we might have before we need to think about it. All right, so let's talk about this. First of all, I hope not for a very long time that we are thinking about a succession plan for Josh Allen. Josh Allen is 28 years old, or he turns 28 in May. So this will be his age 28 season coming up. I think it's pretty clear that Josh Allen is firmly in his prime, and it's also worth noting that he's been by far the most durable quarterback in the NFL, and it's not close. His consecutive game started is much higher than the next highest player at quarterback in terms of consecutive games started. But as you pointed out, his style of play is concerning when you think about longevity. And we know that he's played through some injuries, including some throwing arm injuries to both his elbow and his shoulder. And I think the cautionary tale, the case study that you want to bring up when having this conversation is Cam Newton. and. Cam Newton, big, athletic, big-time arm talent, can run, took a lot of hits. They're not the same player, but there's enough parallels for you to say, well, yeah, I think looking at what happened with Cam Newton is at least worthwhile to consider in this conversation. And for Cam Newton, things really unraveled for him around his age eight, uh, his age 28 and his age 29 season. In 2017, entering his age 28 season, he had surgery to repair a partially torn rotator cuff in his throwing shoulder. And then from there, things really fell downhill. I think the big difference in Cam Newton and Josh Allen is that Josh Allen's a far more refined passer than Cam Newton. And so I think that helps a lot for Josh Allen and projecting him into the future. Ultimately, I think Josh Allen's longevity will be tied to a couple of things. First of all, pocket passing and more reliance on in-structure execution, right? As he ages, he'll have less athleticism. He'll have less ability to rely on that ability to extend plays and win outside of structure. So being able to win from the pocket with even more consistency is going to be critical for him, right? He'll have to win more with his brain. He'll have to win more with his arm than, you know, his freak physical nature and play strength and athleticism, right? So he'll have to evolve a little bit stylistically. But then I think the other piece is how he evolves with his routines, 
which candidly I don't know much about. I don't know what type of priority he has on training pliability and developing the right habits and regiments that position him to best continue playing well into his 30s. I don't know enough about that with Josh Allen. I think you can pick up on some clues based on the things he's discussed and feel like maybe some of that is lacking. But back to this Cam Newton parallel, when Cam Newton was the NFL MVP in 2015, the Carolina Panthers went 15-1, and went to the Super Bowl. That was his age 26 season. Imagine telling Panthers fans after that 2015 season that, yeah, you only got another season of season or two of vintage Cam Newton before the wheels fall off. And I personally don't want to be naive to that idea as it relates to Josh Allen. I do think Josh Allen is a much better and a more complete player than Cam Newton. It's certainly impossible to predict how many more elite seasons Josh Allen has or when you have to start thinking about a succession plan. I don't currently find myself worried that he's going to break down anytime soon. You've certainly heard Josh Allen say that he wants to play for as long as he can. And so time will tell, obviously, but as you bring up this question, that's where my mind goes. Those are the variables in play, and obviously we'll find out. I'm sure when that stadium opens in 2026, we want to watch Josh Allen play a whole lot of football at the new Highmark Stadium. The next one comes from Brandon Bean Season, who says, been seeing a few mock drafts lately with the Bills taking an offensive tackle early. If Spencer Brown shows moderate growth again this year, how much does he stand to make as a free agent? And what are the odds the Bills are willing to pay him his market value? Maybe it's not a bad idea to take an offensive tackle early this year as opposed to relying on a 2025 rookie. So I talked a bit about this on Thursday's episode, or at least the first episode that I dropped on Thursday. We later on in the day did a episode on Deshaun Williams, the Bills' new defensive tackle. But I think right now, Spencer Brown is in line for the Austin Jackson contract. The Miami Dolphins gave Austin Jackson a three-year, $36 million contract. That's $12 million a season last year. And Austin Jackson was a first-round pick of theirs that struggled a lot early in his career. Uh, had some injury stuff, and then this past year it kind of felt like he put it together and became a reliable starter for them. And so I think there's a very similar career arc as it relates to Spencer Brown. So I think as it stands right now, I think he's about a $12 million a year tackle, which again is 27th in the NFL amongst APY for offensive tackles. If Spencer Brown replicates 2023 and even shows some moderate growth, I think that probably puts him into the $15 million APY range. Some comparables there that are in that range, Jack Conklin from the Browns, Jonah Williams, who just signed two years, $30 million with the Arizona Cardinals, Taylor Decker with the Detroit Lions. Those guys are all at $15 million a season. That feels right to me based on Spencer Brown replicating 2023. Then there's also Terrence Steele with the Dallas Cowboys, who's at 16 and a half. So I think that's pretty appropriate. Again, assuming another season of health, another season of at least as good as what we saw this past year. Here's the deal with Spencer Brown. I mean, the team's been around him. They drafted him. They've had him for three years as a starter. They know his habits. They know how he's wired. If they're comfortable with him and his trajectory, I think the Bills do have room for another big contract on their offensive line. Obviously, Deion Dawkins is handsomely paid at left tackle, but you got a rookie starter at right guard. You've got Connor McGovern at center, who's not super expensive. He's like seven, eight million bucks a year. Right now, David Edwards is a three million dollar a year starter at left guard. So I think you have room for another big contract on this offensive line. But are you comfortable with where Spencer Brown is is headed? Are you comfortable with, you know, kind of the back concerns that he's had, right? I mean, six, eight offensive tackle, um, you know, is, is everything good to go with that in terms of 
committing to him for a long-term extension. If they take an offensive tackle early in the 2024 draft, I think that's a pretty clear signal that they are preparing for life after Spencer Brown. And I, I doubt that they'd want to go into the 2025 offseason feeling like they had to find their starting right tackle. And then there's the challenging question of, well, do you do the, do you do the extension now? There's a lot of incentive for doing the extension now. It will never be cheaper than it is right now. Look at what happened with Ed Oliver. They paid him a year early, and that's looking like a phenomenal value contract, a defensive tackle. Look at what happened with Tremaine Edmonds. He didn't pay him early, then he got crazy expensive. To me, I'd, I'd want more information. I'd want to see how this season goes. I'd want to feel even more comfortable about his health and, and just kind of where his body's at. So I lean more in the way of, well, it might cost me a few more million dollars APY, but I'd like to make the most informed decision that I possibly can. And that makes me say, well, let's, let's have 2024 play out. Then we'll talk about an extension. But if there's enough concerns there and the bills go tackle early, well, I think the writing's a little bit on the wall. So we'll see how that plays out as well. All right, we got a bunch more to get to here coming up, including some of my scouting hits and misses, the difference between slot and outside wide receivers, contract values for rookies, and more. So be sure to stick with me. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook because right now new customers can get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. All right, folks, the next one here comes from Michael, who says, you proudly state how important it is to recognize that there will be hits and misses in scouting college players. Who's a player that you properly called would pan out in spite of concerns? And who's a player that proved you wrong? It's a fun question. I'll give you two guys that stand out to me. For the piece of this question that is a player I properly called would pan out in spite of concerns, I'd go right to DK Metcalf. I loved him coming out of Ole Miss. I had a top 10 grade on him, and that was pretty polarizing. Um, I had some people really yell at me for liking DK Metcalf, which is extremely weird. But I love the player, and obviously he's a freak of an athlete. Size, athleticism, right? I mean, explosive, 4-3, 40-yard dash, yoked up dude, right? And it's not just the physical traits. Like, there's plenty of guys that look like Tarzan that aren't good football players. There's plenty of guys that can run a, a fast 40-yard dash and jump all the, the inches, and they're not very good football players. But what sold me on DK Metcalf was the release package. How good he was at Ole Miss early in those routes to be able to get off the line, beat press coverage, and create instant leverage. And he puts corners in a position where they had to play through him. And he was so strong. And I thought the vertical playmaking would just be off the chains. And where I think people pushed back on DK Metcalf was that he, he ran a bad three cone and a bad short shuttle. Like his agilities were bad. And there was this level of disappointment that because DK Metcalf didn't run routes like Antonio Brown, that there wasn't a path for him to be successful in the NFL. Well, he's a guy that can win leverage battles, a guy that can win on the vertical plane in terms of route running, that had really good ball skills and played to that size and physicality that you want. To me, there was, you know, he wasn't going to win like Antonio Brown, but there was absolutely a path based on what he did at an elite level that inspired me to believe that he could be a, a big-time playmaker in the NFL, and that's exactly what he's become. 
And I remember those conversations. I'm like, if you want to get me nervous about DK Metcalf, talk to me about his neck injury, right? He had had surgery and all that stuff. Talk to me about that. Don't talk to me about the skill set. The skill set's clear. There's a very clear path for him to become an impact receiver in the NFL. But because of that three cone drill, people lost their minds. Thought he was uh, too limited. That, that what were everyone said he, he turns like a tractor trailer. Like okay, have you seen him run linear? Have you seen him run vertical? Have you seen the release package? Seen the ball skills? There's multiple ways that wide receivers can win, and I think there was a lot of very narrow minded opinions about DK Metcalf. As for a player that proved me wrong, it's Josh Allen, the Bills quarterback. I did an episode a few years ago. I'd encourage you to go back and find it. it. It's one of my episodes that I'm most proud of, and it's called, it's titled What I Learned Scouting Josh Allen. So I I, I don't want to sit here and rehash that entire podcast, but I had a day two grade on Josh Allen. My scouting report certainly recognized all of the potential that he has. I talked about how he was like the most physically gifted quarterback to enter the NFL and that his ceiling is unlimited and it's really just based on how he can develop. But I, I saw a lot of issues at Wyoming with Josh Allen in terms of, of ball placement and decision-making that typically guys don't get better at. Well, Josh Allen certainly figured out a lot of that. And he was a player that I recognized the talent but I was very willing to say, well, somebody else can figure out if he's going to be good or not. I'd rather have a different quarterback. And I was very wrong about that. And again, if you really want me to flesh that out, go back and find that episode, what I learned scouting Josh Allen. And you'll have, you'll hear a lot of detail as to what I cling to, what I didn't pay enough attention to. And of course, the lessons that I learned. Drew says, what different skill sets are needed for boundary receivers versus slot receivers? I thought the main difference is the boundary players need to have a good release package and need to succeed without a two-way go. Is there more to it? Well, Drew, I think that is a, a lot of it. Um, but I want to flesh that out a little bit and talk about the whys. And I think what we'll start with is talking about outside receivers, so not the slot. Outside receivers, one time it was explained to me that uh, by an NFL wide receiver coach that playing outside, those are heavyweight fights. You know, you're you're dealing with tight press coverage. Guys are able to get in your face and you got to beat them off the line of scrimmage. You're playing in a wider alignment, right? You're further from the ball. You're further from the quarterback. So not only do you have to be able to separate with tighter coverage on you, but you have to maintain that leverage for longer. Oh, by the way, the defender has one heck of a extra helper in the form of the sideline. That sideline's undefeated, right? So there's just, you got to be more physical. You have to be able to have the technique to create leverage. And you have to be able to maintain that leverage. Oh, by the way, the sideline's right there and it's undefeated. It's the greatest defensive player in the history of football. It's never missed a single tackle, right? So you got you to gotta be mindful of that. On the slot, you get free releases, right? Like nobody can line up on top of you. You might get some slot corners that are willing to crowd you a little bit, but they can't play on the line of scrimmage in your face. Also, it's typically a tighter alignment to the ball. So therefore, you don't really have to maintain that leverage for longer. Now, one thing I want to point out is it's not all about size. There are plenty of <laughs> exceptional receivers that play on the outside that are not very big. And it's not all about play strength. It's about technique. And okay, if these guys are going to play up in my face and I have to be able to clear them. Well, it's not all about just being able to play through it. You can reduce your surface area. You can have jukes. You can have different footwork at the line of scrimmage that enables you to clear that contact and get into your route step. There's, there's more ways to do it than just, well, I can run through the press. 
Stephon Diggs is a great example of that. Stephon Diggs isn't a huge receiver, but he plays almost exclusively on the outside. He can beat press coverage because of a variety of reasons. So hopefully that gave you some insight on this outside versus slot. There's a lot of players that are interchangeable. There's a lot of guys that are slot only. Obviously, you want us, you know, to be able to do as much as possible to help a football team. John says, considering that wide receivers and edge rushers are the highest paid average annual salaries, not including high level quarterbacks, why would GMs take best available in the draft at the value of a best available safety or guard is nowhere near the cap commitment of a best available edge or wide receiver? I understand what you're what you're saying there, and I think this is an important layer to the conversation where if you really want to maximize the value of a contract, there are certain positions that make more sense uh, early in the draft, particularly in the first round. And in some cases, that's important to be mindful of. I think it's a layer. It can't be everything. And let's make this very practical. So the Bills pick 28th in the first round. That player is going to get a four-year, $13.5 million contract. That's going to be an average annual salary of four of $3.4 million. So $3.4 million would be the 41st highest paid quarterback, 23rd highest paid running back, 59th highest paid wide receiver, 30th highest paid tight end, 56th offensive tackle, 39th guard, 21st center, 82nd edge, 49th defensive tackle, 19th linebacker, 44th corner, 40th safety. And the thing about the way rookie deals are handed out, it's it doesn't matter what position you play. It matters what pick you were, what number pick. So this is definitely something to be mindful of. It can't be everything, but it's definitely a layer to the the process. You know, I think it's whenever you start talking about linebackers. You start talking about running backs. Yeah, there's some questions to ask yourself, especially if you're moving up in the – like you're picking higher than 28. The Bills are picking 28, so I think it's less of a talking point. But if you're picking 10, 11, 12, 13, then those APYs are higher, yeah, you start asking yourself some questions about if this is the best way to maximize the value of this draft selection. So good talking point there, John. All right, we've got more to get to. We'll talk about Chop Robinson on the other side of this the hip swivel tackle. And somebody asked me if I was an NFL free agent, who are the three teams I would want to play for most and the three teams I would least want to play for. So that's all coming your way here in just a moment. So be sure to stick with me. All right, folks, the next one comes from Alex. Alex says, with Chop Robinson, who's the Penn State edge rusher, And we talked about him recently on the podcast. Alex says, my concern is that he'll be another Odafe Owe. Owe, as a prospect, was all athletic traits with little college production. And so far, the lack of production has extended into his NFL career. I will push back on that in just a second. I'm not saying Robinson and Owe are one-for-one comparisons. No prospect should be scouted against anybody but himself. But I'm wondering, what steps do you take to try to project a prospect translating to the pros? And what about Robinson specifically makes you confident his NFL production will exceed his college production? So let's talk about Odafe Owe real quick here, who has not been bad, who has not been absent of production. He's had three NFL seasons to this point. He's had at least five sacks in two of those. He had 51 pressures last year, which is more than Jonathan Grenard, who just got paid like $17 million a season to go to Minnesota. That's more than Demarcus Lawrence. That's more than Kayvon Thibodeau on less pass rush snaps. Oh, by the way, Odafe Owe was 12th in PFF pass rush productivity among edge rushers with at least 275 pass rush snaps in the NFL in 2023. 12th. That's better than Max Crosby. That's better than Brian Burns. That's better than Daniil Hunter, to name a few. So let's let's be careful here. If you want to bring up Odafe Owe and say that he's not been productive in the NFL after he wasn't productive in college, I think that's inaccurate, as evidenced by the information I just gave you. As to the other piece of this conversation about what specifically about Chop Robinson gives me confidence that he will be more productive in the NFL 
than he was in college. Well, I think we can start with Odafe Owe as an example of a guy that had insane athleticism that wasn't productive in college and what and has been productive in the NFL to this point. You you knew with Odafe Owe that it was going to be of a be a bit of a, a process to get him going, and he's coming off of a really good season. And he's going to have more and more opportunity now in, in Baltimore with uh, Kyle Van Oy and Jadavion Clowney no longer part of the mix there. He's going to have a real opportunity to have a monster fourth season. What do I like about Chop? I, I like his game. 6'3", 254. That's much bigger than some people thought he was going to be. 33 and a half inch arms. Insane athlete. I love the first step quickness. I love the bend and flexibility. His ability to corner edges and run at a steep angle is outstanding. I love the effort and motor. I like how he, despite being a lean player at 254 pounds, can convert convert speed to power and set firm edges against the run. He's twitchy. He can slip blocks. I think he has a good sense for finding soft spots in the pocket and attacking elite athleticism. I think he's got good pass rush variety with what he's put on tape. So it's always about the traits and how the traits translate to the NFL. And that burst and that bend and that power for his size and the length, those are winning things in the NFL as an outside pass rusher. So I am always willing to acknowledge that I could be wrong, all right? I'm going to be wrong about a lot of these evaluations. And that's just scouting. You're, you're going to miss. You're going to miss all the time. But when I look at the package that Chop Robinson offers, I see translatable skill, translatable traits that inspire me to, me to believe that he's going to be a really good NFL pass rusher. We had I, I remember similar conversations about Brian Burns. People told me I was crazy for liking Brian Burns. All right. Brian Burns is one heck of an NFL pass rusher. I, I am absolutely lo- leaving room to be wrong about Chop Robinson, just like I am every player that I talk about. Because it is a crapshoot. And predicting future performance for people in the NFL, when we're talking about guys in their early 20s, that are suddenly going to become, you know, multimillionaires and have more free time than they ever had in their entire life. I don't know. Right. But I think there's a, when I watch the tape, I see translatable skill that gets me excited. Nigel says with the hip drop tackle being banned, do you anticipate an uptick in the value of big bodied pass catchers? My mind keeps going to the play where Mark Andrews got hurt this past season. Obviously we don't want injuries but I'm also not sure what else that defender was supposed to do when you're smaller and trying to bring down a Clydesdale like Mark Andrews. This leads me to the second part. What exactly is a smaller defensive back supposed to do against big pass catchers and big running backs now that they can't just grab on and drop their weight to bring a ball carrier down? How do you anticipate their technique changing? Well, first of all, I think think so much of this outrage is overblown. I really do. There were 230 instances last year in the NFL, a 65% increase from 2022. This is not a historically normal way of tackling people. It's a new thing. It's new. This isn't your glory days of watching football in the 60s and 70s, right? That's not what they did. People that say that are just making it up. It's a new form of tackling. So do whatever you did prior run your feet through contact, wrap up and run your feet instead of dropping them. Like to me, it's, it's not that hard to figure this out. Instead of trapping the guy's leg and falling on it, run your feet through the tackle. And I think on the other side of that, what that I think what you're going to see more of is smaller defenders are going to start diving at knees more. Remember Antoine Winfield? He wasn't hip drop tackling. He was diving at ankles and knees and, and taking guys' legs out. That's what they're going to do. So maybe you have a another concern on your hands, but I think that's where the pivot's going to be. Pluribus says, Joe, if you were hitting free agency, what would be your top three and bottom three organizations to play for? All right, so this is fun. I will say a couple of things before I give you my top three and bottom three. 
first of all, my status as a player would matter a lot because my priorities would change based on my status, what position I play, how old am I, how much money have I made in my career, right? Your priorities are going to be different. So that's the first piece of this that I don't have the answer to. And then I think generally speaking, I would not want to go somewhere that felt like there was a regime change that was imminent. And I'd prefer to play for either a well-established infrastructure or a new regime where I'm one of the guys, right? The last thing you want to do is go to some situation where everyone's getting fired after the season and everybody knows it. And now you're brought in and some other regime comes and takes over and you're not one of their guys. That's the reality of the NFL. When you switch head coaches or general managers, the roster gets flipped. So I wouldn't want to be part of that. So I'll try to answer this as best I can in a vacuum because I don't know my status as a player. I don't know what position I play. I don't know how much money I've made. I don't know if I, you know, I, my priorities are, are unknown at this point. But my top three and my bottom three, and I'm going to not include the bills in this because I don't want to deal with any Homer stuff, but I, the bills would obviously be number one. So top three, um, the Rams. I think the Rams would be a great place to go. Les Snead is very established as a general manager. Sean McVay, at head coach. And I, I, what I really appreciate about the Rams is I feel like they're very legitimate in the opportunities that they give players to compete and play. You see that team, regardless of where guys were brought in from, late picks, you know, low dollar signings, they have legit competition on that roster. And you see it happen all the time. Brian Allen was signed to a three-year extension. Coleman Shelton beat him out at center. Joe Noteboom was signed to a big-time extension. And Alaric Jackson beat him out at left tackle. Puka Nakua gets that opportunity as a fifth-round pick. Jordan Fuller, as a late-round safety, gets a chance to start. John Johnson. I mean, like, example after example after example. Ernest Jones at Mike Linebacker. I think their opportunities are legit. And their player development's been really good. The Houston Texans is, in, is high on my list. They're in my top three. I just feel like they're going places. You know, I I like their infusion of talent. I like their young quarterback in C.J. Stroud. D'Amico Ryans looks like an awesome head coach. They're a young football team, and that cost them last year in the playoffs. But I think they're going places, and I'd want to latch on to that. And then the last one is the Baltimore Ravens. I just think they're the model of stability in so many ways with Harbaugh, with Eric DaCosta, with how they just do business. I, I would... I'd find myself wanting to be part of that. And I think they've in some ways been like the Rams where opportunity is earned um, based on what you do while you're there. My bottom three, the Arizona Cardinals. I don't think they're serious about football in Arizona. Uh, Michael Bidwell is a clown as an owner. Um, I just, I, no, I don't want to be part of that. Uh, the New Orleans Saints, uh, primarily because I feel like at some point they're going to implode with. Yeah, it's got to be exhausting, their team-building strategy with the cap gymnastics that they do all the time, uh, the void years on every single contract. They don't feel like – they feel like they're just stuck in mediocrity. Um, and I think Dennis Allen's going to get fired. I think at some point ownership's going to get tired of Mickey Loomis and how he's approached this salary cap management, and they're going to blow it up. So they're off my list. And then the Jets. Um, I think the Jets are a team that searches for sparks. Um, they're always bad. Uh, quarterbacks are never good. And I think so much of that is dictated by operationally, how they function, uh, their market. It's just why the jets have literally never had a good quarterback. Like I just, I, there's something's wrong there. Something's wrong there. So I wouldn't want to be part of it. So Cardinals saints and jets would be my bottom three, plenty of other contenders, but a lot of those contenders are, uh, new regimes. And so like Washington or, or Carolina, like, all right, if I went there, at least I'd be part of year one of a new regime. And the other thing with the Jets is, doesn't it feel like if this doesn't work this year with Aaron Rodgers, that like Sala and, and Joe Douglas are gone, so they're going to be hitting reset. So that's another reason why the Jets are not for me. All right, folks, Herd Mentality in the books. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you'll come back. Hope you'll take a second to make sure that you are subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills, and I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.